Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching this evening's program online. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, as well as the Mass Cultural Council and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. Here at the JFK Library, one of the stories we tell is of the two weeks in October 1962, when the world teetered on the edge of thermo thermonuclear war and the end of civilization as we know it. It was a close call, maybe the closest call in human history. Today, those two weeks are known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the peaceful res resolution of the crisis is considered to be one of President Kennedy's greatest achievements. I mentioned this landmark moment in US foreign policy, among others worldwide that President Kennedy faced during his time in office, because I think that one of the most important lessons we can learn from history and history museums like the JFK Library is that our country has faced difficult and divided times before, and that principled leadership and a commitment to our fundamental values has always helped us find a better way forward. At a time of so much suffering, rising tensions, and terrible conflict in Israel and Gaza and in the Ukraine, we are particularly grateful to explore U.S. foreign policy challenges and opportunities with our distinguished panelists tonight. I'm now honored to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm so pleased to expect, extend a warm virtual welcome to the library to Michael Beckley, Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University, non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and director of the Asia program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. His research on great power competition has received multiple awards from the American Political Science Association and the International Studies Association and appeared in numerous national and international media outlets. He has served as an international security fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School and worked for the US Department of Defense, the Rand Corporation and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He continues to advise offices within the US intelligence community and the US Department of Defense. His most recent book co-authored with Hal Brands is Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China. I'm also delighted to welcome Kimberly Martin to the library virtually. A professor of political science at Barnard College, Columbia University, she specializes in international relations, international security, Russia, and the global politics of climate change. She is a faculty member and executive committee member of Columbia's Harriman. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, an adjunct lecturer at the Johns Hopkins School of Adva Advanced International Studies, a distinguished visiting professor at the Annenberg School of Public Diplomacy at USC, an associate fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs Chatham House in the UK, and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson's Mexico Institute, the Woodrow Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. He writes a bi-column week, a, a bi-weekly column in Mexico City's El Universal newspaper participates in a weekly Mexican television newscast on Molino TV and a weekly radio segment, and frequently publishes op-eds in, in US media outlets. A career diplomat in the Mexican Foreign Service for 22 years, he served as Mexico's ambassador to the US from 2007 to 2013. And I'm so glad to welcome our moderator for this evening, Ravi Agrawal to the library virtually. The editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy, he is also the host of FP Live, the magazine's video channel and podcast on which he regularly interviews world leaders and policymakers. Before joining FP in 2018, he worked at CNN for more than a decade in full-time roles spanning three continents, including as the network's New Delhi bureau chief and correspondent. He has shared a Peabody Award and three Emmy nominations for his work as a TV producer, and his writing for FP was part of a series nominated for a 2020 National Magazine Award for Columns and Commentary. He is the author of India Connected, How the Smartphone is Transforming the World's Largest Democracy. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. <laughs> 
Rachel, thank you so much to you and your team at the Kennedy Library for bringing all of us together. I speak for uh, all of the guests when I say we're thankful to be here and to speak to your audience. And a big welcome on my behalf to my guests, Michael, Kim, and Arturo. So we are here to discuss a very, very broad topic, current challenges for U.S. foreign policy. And unfortunately, there are many real big challenges confronting our policymakers right now. Israel is currently waging war on Hamas after that group's horrific attack on southern Israel on October 7. It may yet become a broader regional war involving Iranian proxies such as Hezbollah in Lebanon, or the Houthi rebels in Yemen. America, of course, plays an important role in all of this, not just as a key Israeli ally, but also as a regional stabilizer and deal maker, if that wasn't enough. We already have a war going on in Ukraine. It's been 21 months since Russia now invaded Ukraine. And as that war continues, Russian President Vladimir Putin is looking on and thinking that maybe, just maybe, the West will tire of supporting Ukraine and allow him to win. That's two wars, and there's a constant threat of a third, and that's China potentially invading Taiwan, which could then potentially turn into a broader conflict between the United States and China. All of that, of course, makes diplomacy between Washington and Beijing more important than ever before. I frame these three challenges in U.S. foreign policy as wars, but there are, of course, many other challenges from climate change to migration to trade policy, and we will try and touch on as many of those as we can. We have about 90 minutes. I urge you, wherever you're watching or listening from around the world, to send in your questions. You see the instructions on your screens. Follow them. The questions will come to me, and I'll try to bring them in to the conversation. So let's get started. We're going to begin with the Middle East. Michael, I thought I'd start with you. How worried are you about a wider regional war breaking out? Well, we're we're talking about the Middle East, Ravi, so I'm extremely worried. Um, you know, wars are are easy to start, but they're really hard to end. They usually get messy, and I can see a number of ways how this uh, conflict could escalate. One, you already mentioned, there's an array of proxies uh, already doing battle and trading tit for tat reprisals. You had Iranian proxies attacking U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria and some U.S. counterstrikes. You had Houthi allies in Yemen firing missiles at Israel, and those were intercepted by a U.S. destroyer. You know, the good news is that you haven't seen large-scale attacks from other actors, and you would think that if those were going to occur, they would have occurred close to October 7th, just to take advantage of Israel's uh, shock and, and surprise. But I also worry that if this if this conflict goes on longer, which it almost certainly will, that you know how long are Hezbollah and Iran going to be uh, waiting and restrained? I, I, it's hard for me to imagine they're just going to sit there and watch Hamas get eradicated from from Gaza, and you know Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets or maybe more aimed at Israel. Um, a second factor is we have to take the fact that Israel is probably going to not just attack Hamas, but is looking to strike. Iranian targets or maybe assassinate Iranian officials that are linked to the planning for the Hamas strike. And so that'll set off its own set of retaliations, or maybe the United States will, you know, there are some in the U.S. policymaking community that say we should be hitting Iran much harder, that they should be disproportionate responses to this because we have to restore deterrence after a long period in which the U.S. was either doing nothing in, in exchange for Iran's provocations or just letting Iran get away with a slap on the wrist. There's obviously the nuclear factor. Um, you know, Iran is still pursuing a nuclear weapon, and some people think it may be very close to getting that. So that obviously would open up the floodgates to potential attacks there. And then, as we'll talk about, I'm sure, later in this conversation, uh, you see increasing cooperation between Iran Russia, China, North Korea. And so there's just this sort of motley crew of actors that are all colluding, and that just sets itself up for a chain reaction of conflicts spreading out. So hopefully uh, cooler heads will prevail, but I, I really don't see much of a route of avoiding some type of escalation. here. Mm. Well, let's talk about one of the actors that um, you're describing there. Kim, I'm going to bring you in at this point. How do you think Iran is viewing Israel's war in Gaza right now? We know that Iran, of course, is uh, the backer of Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, so clearly, in a sense, it is indirectly involved already. But how do you think Tehran is gaming out whether it needs to escalate? 
Well, Ravi, it's a very complicated question. And of course, as you said, Iran has been a backer of Hamas, a financial backer, a political backer, and the Hamas attack had to have been planned well in advance. We don't have evidence at the moment um, that Iran is responsible for planning the attack per se, uh, but the timing benefits Iran in the sense that uh, an overreaction by Israel uh, risks disrupting the Abraham Accords and certainly any hope for uh, reaching some sort of a peace accord between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which had appeared to be on the horizon um, and would definitely be something that would harm Iranian interests in spreading its own interest uh, against the Arab states. That having been said, I guess I'm a little bit more hopeful than Michael is that this uh, will not spread uh, uh, too uh, deeply and that Iran has uh, very strong motives to exercise restraint. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Iran does not have any particular motive to bring Lebanon, where Hezbollah uh, has a leadership role into this conflict and to have the uh, Israeli attacks uh, against Lebanon increase uh, especially since the United States has made clear with Anthony Blinken's uh, visits uh, in recent days that the United States is prepared to get more involved if Iran uh, does get more involved and if Hezbollah does uh, directly attack Israel uh, in greater depth. Um, I think because of Iran's cooperation with Russia, it also has an incentive to try to keep things relatively restrained in Syria. Uh, uh, it would not be in Russian interest for Syria to become destabilized. Um, and so for those reasons, uh, even though Iran is in many ways benefiting from the current situation, I think that there are reasons to hope that Iran uh, would act with more restraint going forward as well. Mm. I'm going to zoom out a little bit as I bring Arturo in, and then I'm going to come back uh, to a few more micro issues um, about the Middle East. But Arturo, so you were Mexico's ambassador to the United States for quite a while, and I'm curious how you see the so-called global south reacting uh, to this conflict, because there is a perceived double standard, I think, in developing countries where the prevailing view seems to be that the United States and the West, more broadly, should be doing more for Gaza. And they look at the West's contrasting policies towards Gaza and Ukraine, and they go, wait a minute, we thought you were telling us to support territorial integrity. Um, talk to about talk to us about that mood and, and the sense of uh, a double standard uh, in the global south. Um, first, Ravi, I don't think there's such a thing as a global south. Um, I think this is a term that has become sort of popular as of late, as people try and understand this div divide in positions regarding condemnation of Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, there are countries that do seem to have sort of similar outlooks, geopolitical outlooks, but to assume that there's a generic global south perspective on these issues I, I think that's a bit that's a bit uh bold i think what there is is you've got a certain group of pivotal states that are playing uh to try and reap benefits from specific uh uh policy drivers um and are are sort of playing their geopolitics a la carte uh, depending on what's at stake, which region of the world this is taking place, but but yeah, there there is there is I think a general sense of inconsistency as as people, societies, governments look at how the U.S. has approached the both the Ukraine and and the Hamas attack on Israel. I think that many countries feel that um, the the U.S. only the U.S. and the European Union reacted to Russian aggression because it was in Europe. And that there have been a number of instances where international aggression, violence has gone um, unchallenged by the geopolitical West, if you like. Um, but I also would like to, I think, underscore that I, I am a bit concerned as to the positions that many countries that supposedly adhere to a, to a very Westphalian sense of international policy and international affairs, uh, the UN Charter, international law, because it would seem that when uh, the US is the violator, then everyone condemns that violation of international law. But if it's someone else, like what has happened recently in Eastern Europe, uh, you've got a lot of fence sitters and, and countries that I'm thinking of Mexico, I'm thinking of Brazil, 
I'm thinking of countries that traditionally talk the talk of upholding the UN Charter, the uh, principles of international law, of non-intervention, of peaceful resolution of, con of, of differences, of respect for the national sovereignty of nations, and have stayed quiet when it comes to denouncing the violation of the UN Charter by Russia, the uh, premeditated invasion of a sovereign and independent nation, Ukraine, um, the uh, increasing proof that um, war crimes and war and crimes against humanity have been committed in Ukraine, um, and countries that you know, if 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 this were happening elsewhere, they would probably be assuming a much more vocal criticism of precisely those violations of international rights. So um, I, I think you're seeing what you're seeing, I think, is a greater fluidity in the um, in the international system, a, a greater a la carte predisposition by governments to align with one block or the other, um, something which I think is a common thread their rejection of sort of the you're with me or you're against me type of politics in the past and that may be driving a lot of this um but and you see some of that in the BRICS plus summit that just took place a few months ago um but 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 there is there is i think a, a growing sense of disenchantment with u.s leadership um certainly in some of these quote-unquote global south countries um, and and there will no doubt be be capitals and and foreign ministries pointing to some of the contradictions of how the U.S. is um, reacting and engaging regarding Russian aggression in Eastern Europe, and how the U.S. is reacting and engaging both Hamas, uh, the the Palestinians, the Middle East, and this particular particular Israeli government when it comes to the painful events that we've been seeing unfold uh, mm. in Israel, in Gaza over the past 10 days. Mm. You know, Arturo, I too think that Global South is uh, an imperfect term, but it's a term that many in our community continue to use. It is it is the term we have right now. Um, so oh, it, it, it's, it's, an, it's an easy way to try and fit in um, a number of countries that have different outlooks but that not do not necessarily align amongst themselves and of you course see that, and, and and it's you, not you a model that very powerfully in the bricks absolutely absolutely and we'll come back to discuss a little bit more about um how the world is aligned in different blocks that have um various sort of forms of influence and that too is a major challenge i think to uh u.s foreign policy um but staying with the middle east um uh, michael i interviewed uh ehud barak on my show fp live last week and this is israel's most decorated soldier he's a former pm former army chief defense minister and i asked him if he was worried about israel losing global support and he said something that stayed with me he said they were expecting it they expected global public support to run out in a few more weeks. But that also tells me that they're calculating this and that beyond a certain point, they don't care that much uh, about what the rest of the world thinks. They've gained this out. They they know what they need to do, which is elim eliminate Hamas. Um, and they're going to do whatever it takes to do that. My question to you then as a watcher of U.S. foreign policy is, does does the White House not have that much leverage with Israel anymore? Yeah, I, I really don't think when it comes to something that it may not be existential, but the security of the Israeli people is clearly at risk in a way we haven't seen in, in many years. And so under those conditions, how much leverage can the United States really have? How can the United States tell Israel to fight in a certain way? And I, I've heard that phrase, I we don't care from other Israeli uh, leaders, from interviews that I've heard in the media that they just expect that, you know, they, they compare it to Holocaust denial. And there's just this idea that um, th there's there's just a certain class of people and, and they're large and, and sizable around the world that are going to hold Israel to a ridiculously high standard when it comes to the use of force, that are going to judge Israel's existence as itself an affront. And so under those conditions, there's no real point in trying to play the PR game that you just have to do what you need to do to ensure the security of 
your people. And I can I can only imagine how emotional this issue is for everyone in Israel, just seeing the the hundreds of thousands of people coming back to Israel to stand and, and fight, I think really underscores that this is viewed maybe not existential from the survival of Israel in general, but certainly for the ability of Israel to secure its people. There's just no, what, what can the United States really offer under those kind of circumstances to really get Israel to change anything it wouldn't do otherwise? Mm. And Kim, I want to ask you how you think America has been handling this challenge that began on October 7 with this horrific attack on Israel. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has now been to the, the region three times in the last month. Uh, President Biden has visited the region. And, you know, when they go around and meet um, Arab leaders, what they tend to hear is a lot of criticism. And the criticism often goes along the lines of, you know, why aren't you more focused on preventing Israel from uh, taking civilian lives in Gaza? Why don't you do something about the two-state solution? And there's a lot of dissent as well internally uh, in the United States. Um, there's been a fair bit of reporting now that within the State Department, within other U.S. agencies, there's a fair number of rank-and-file staffers who've been saying that the U.S. needs to push for a ceasefire, which, of course, Israel um, is rejecting uh, at this point of time. Talk to us a little bit, Kim, about how you're seeing the United States juggle um, this very tricky diplomatic moment in the Middle East, trying to stand by Israel, but also facing a lot of internal and global criticism. Well, Ravi, it's obviously very difficult. And I think one thing that we could perhaps criticize the administration for um, is not having a, a wide enough global perspective uh, at the start of the administration, as all of these various problems have cropped up all around the world uh, because of the pivot that has been going on towards China in particular. But I think in the wake of the crisis, in the wake of the uh, really horrific attacks, I think the Biden administration has been doing a fantastic job uh, of attempting to uh, really reach out at a diplomatic level very widely uh, in any way that is possible. I think what we know about the weapons deliveries that have come from the United States, uh, that they are actually geared towards uh, attempting to encourage Israel to limit uh, the kinds of activities it's undertaken. Uh, we know that the US has been supplying precision munitions uh, to Israel, precision bombs, uh, that would allow it to avoid uh, using some of the very large bombs that it has been choosing to use. We know that it has been uh, supplying artillery that's primarily useful for its border uh, with Lebanon and dealing with Hezbollah in both Lebanon and Syria. Um, and then we know that the United States has been trying as much as possible to suggest to the Israeli leadership that it is in Israel's interest uh, both to uh, make it very clear that it is adhering to international law as much as possible uh, in terms of the proportionality of its targets, uh, and uh, also in thinking about the long-term uh, political solution that Israel has in mind. And I think Michael is right that there are real limits of what the United States can do, and so we shouldn't expect that the United States can control Israeli actions but I really can't imagine anything more that the Biden administration uh, could do as, as far as what has been happening so far uh, in terms of giving uh, support to our very important Israeli ally, both for uh, being a, a democracy in the Middle East, for playing a crucial geopolitical role uh, in terms of its location, and then in terms of being the only homeland that's available for the Jewish people uh, with a historical memory of the Holocaust behind them. Um, uh, and so I, I think that we have to, to give the Biden administration a lot of credit for the successes that it has had in an incredibly difficult environment, and also recognize that Israel is facing uh, one of the most difficult military challenges that you can imagine, because it is attempting to hit underground tunnels that are purposely located by Hamas operatives underneath the most heavily populated areas. And then Hamas has been discouraging the population from leaving. 
So we're in a situation where Hamas has been intentionally creating uh, civilian targets that Israel really has no choice except to hit, even though um, that does not appear to be what Israel is trying to do. And so I think amidst the, the criticism that we're hearing of Israel, we have to recognize the situation it's facing um, and the barbaric policies that Hamas has been following uh, in terms of its own complete uh, 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 inability and unwillingness to recognize anything about the law of war. Mm. That's very well put, Kim. So I'm going to take us now to another war on another continent that's also having a profound impact on the world when it comes to everything from democracy to food prices to the energy markets. And that is, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Kim, I'm going to start with you on this one, because I know you follow Russia very closely. And Putin at this point, do you think he's feeling like he can outlast the West? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, Ravi, I think that Putin believes that he can uh, maintain what he's doing. The evidence that we have is that Russia is actually preparing uh, to launch an additional uh, offensive at this point further into uh, Ukraine. Uh, there had been hope uh, in the West that perhaps Russia would run out of weapons. But of course, we've seen that instead they are turning to other pariah states, both Iran and North Korea, to supply them with weapons. We had been hoping that they would have difficulties with the mobilization of sufficient numbers of troops. And what we've seen is that they have gone to prison labor, starting with the Wagner Group use of prison troops uh, last year, but then continuing with the regular Russian military use of prison troops this year. And Putin has absolutely no incentive to stop his offensive. Um, he has the Russian population still behind him. Uh, there was a huge outflow of uh, people who were dissidents and opponents uh, in Russia. Hundreds of thousands of people left Russia in 2022, and so he doesn't have to worry about those loud voices anymore. And I think what Putin's desire is more than anything else is to hold out until uh, what he believes is going to happen in the 2024 election in the United States, uh, which is that the Republicans are increasingly turning away from support for Ukraine. And I think uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has hopes that uh, President Trump could win the 2024 election again. And at that point, along with uh, what he hopes might be a significant Republican representation in the Congress, uh, uh, withdraw U.S. support. And if U.S. support was withdrawn from Ukraine, there's no way that Europe uh, in and of itself could maintain that support. And so I think that is what uh, Putin is aiming for at the moment. Mm. Arturo, um, the country you represented as a diplomat, Mexico, has stayed neutral in the ongoing war in Ukraine. It's refused to join U.S.-led sanctions against Russia. You're not in the government anymore, so you can speak freely. Do you think that's the right stance? Arturo, I think you muted yourself. That has to happen at least once in that every, has to happen every at least once, once tonight. Yeah, um, I was saying that that uh, I've been very critical of this Mexican government's position on on Ukraine and on Russian aggression. I think it's a big mistake. Um, even though the Mexican foreign ministry has voted to condemn Russian aggression in the UN, the president's uh, president Observador's public positioning on this, his public stance has been to uh, uh, avoid condemning Russia. Um, he continues to preach from the bully pulpit with this uh, false equivalence that um, uh, collective defense and collective support for Ukraine under uh, Article 51 of, of the UN Charter is equal to or is equivalent to Russian aggression in Ukraine, which is absolutely absurd. Um, he, like Lula, have uh, suggested that it's Europe and the United States by arming and helping Ukraine to defend itself that, that are fanning the war with Russia. Um, so so I, and and the problem is that, you know, this is the United States' largest trading partner. Uh, Mexico is now the number one trading partner of the United States. We share a 3000 kilometer border with the United States um, and to have uh, the United States main trading partner, one of its neighbors, uh, a country that will be critically important in the U.S. recalibration of its ties with China when it comes to trade, to the digital economy, to nearshoring, to supply chains, to uh, an energy paradigm for North America, that Mexico is articulating these positions. And, and I, I completely agree with Kimberly. I think that uh, right now, uh, Vladimir Putin is rubbing his hands, um, first of all, watching what is going on in the Middle East, because he knows that munitions that could be going to Ukraine 
are headed now to uh, support uh, some of the Israeli units um, that need these same types of munitions. Second, uh, I think he is openly betting on uh, at least, if not Trump, then the Republican Party coming back to power in 2024. And that opens a whole, uh, it's an old can of worms because we've already seen it play in 2016, but it's uh, how Russia will seek to, via disinformation, via uh, social media, to again play a role in the U.S. presidential election in 2024, uh, clearly trying to buttress and support the Republican uh, Party, and if it's Donald Trump, particularly Donald Donald Trump's um, attempt to return to the White House. So uh, I do think that the fact that you've got a country like Mexico, that you've got other countries like Brazil, for example, um, in contrast to Chile, um, you know, many people think, oh, well, because they're sort of left of center governments. Well, you've got a center left of government in, in Santiago, Chile today, and President Boric has been absolutely clear that um, Chile needs to openly condemn Russian aggression. It needs to condemn Russian violation of international law. And that's what I think a progressive left of center, cosmopolitan uh, president and political party in the 21st century need to look like when it comes to issues of war and peace and international stability. So I, I do find it very troubling that that my country um, is... is uh, uh, is articulating, uh, you know, this this false narrative. Of, oh, we're neutral uh, when we all know that this neutrality, at the end of the day, is only providing Russia with diplomatic uh, cover and with, um, I'd even probably say, legitimacy. And if you scratch a bit deeper, it's not a coincidence that um, the largest expansion of GRU, the military intelligence branch of the uh, Russian army, uh, the largest number of new GR, GRU agents to be stationed at a diplomat, the Russian diplomatic posting, so happens to be Mexico City. We've had a huge increase since the uh, invasion of Ukraine of uh, Russian diplomats in the Russian embassy in Mexico City. And the speculation is uh, that most of these are GRU agents and it's not a coincidence they're they're being sent precisely to Mexico City at this juncture. Wow. Um, Michael, I'm not sure if you agree or disagree with what Arturo and Kim have been saying, but, you know, we're one to assume that Putin is looking at the way things are going and is rubbing his hands in glee, as, as Arturo said, and then also that we have this sort of ticking clock uh, that leads us to the 2024 elections and potential U.S. sort of withdrawal of support, or at least the level of support um, that it's currently providing to Ukraine. If you make those two assumptions, do you think then that Ukraine might be any more or less likely to consider a diplomatic solution to the war? It's so tough because the Ukrainians, what they've done with their their courage, their valor, I mean, they've they've more than earned the right to define the terms of victory. But, you know, in the world that we live in, um, justice doesn't always prevail. And, you know, they're they're losing a lot of people. Um, they're they're really running out of people in prime military age fighting. And I don't see how anyone's going to be able to send reinforcements to them. Um, they they need millions more rounds of, of ammunition to keep up the fight. And as as Kimberly noted, I mean, you know, th th I think the other fundamental problem is this war is taking place in their house. And so all of the carnage is being wrecked upon their country. So they're doubly paying the costs. So um, it's, you know, one thing we can probably count on is there will be something that happens. Um, I, I didn't expect it to be this war in the Middle East, but there will probably be something else that occurs that will throw these predictions off. Mm -hmm. But present trends, you know, because if, if the level of sport remains constant, then Russia is going to have a big advantage. It becomes a war of attrition. So the Western amount of material support to Ukraine needs to significantly increase to really change the battlefield outcomes and given the political dynamics that Arturo and um, uh, Kimberly have already have sketched out, um, it's really hard to see any kind of decisive military victory for the Ukrainians as they've currently defined it, pushing Russia off of all of their territory. Now, maybe they'll eventually come and settle and say, look, we, there's no way we can take back all the territory. But if we can put ourselves on the path to joining the EU, if we can get a security security 
guarantee, then that in some ways is even more important than taking back the territory. Because if Russia is still fighting, um, they can launch attacks against Ukraine from Russian territory anyway. So mm. maybe that'll occur, but I can totally understand why that would be a very bitter pill for the Ukrainians to swallow. And they've certainly earned the right to uh, define the terms of victory. Mm. Tim, uh, you know, you were praising uh, the Biden administration earlier for the way in which it's handled a very tricky situation in the Middle East. I'm curious how you rate them on how they've managed the situation in Ukraine. Uh, one criticism uh, of the administration over the last couple of years has been that they always say, no, we're not going to provide weapon X. Um, or whatever the request of the month is, and they say, no, 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 no. And then lo and behold, a few months later, they agree to provide that very weapon. And we've seen this play out many times now with many different types of requests from Ukraine. Uh, do you think that the White House has played this right, uh, not only sort of in hindsight, but looking forward now to the clock ticking exactly one year to go for the next election and a potential change in U.S. policy? Well, Ravi, I think one of the things that came as a surprise to a lot of people is that the Republican Party as a whole is not maintaining the bipartisan support uh, for U.S. foreign policy, especially in relationship to Russia, that it has traditionally done. And so I think that came as a surprise to many people. Um, in terms of the, um, the relatively slow supplying of new kinds of weapons, I, I, I understand completely what you're saying, and I understand the frustrations very much of the Ukrainian people that they eventually get things, but perhaps not in the time frame uh, that would have been ideal. And I can understand the frustrations. Uh, but I think that we also have to recognize that there has been a danger. And until you go forward and actually have the battle going, you don't know what that danger is going to turn out to be of Russia deciding that it has had some kind of a red line crossed. Um, and therefore now it wants to widen the war further. And perhaps at this point, we have enough evidence that it is not in Russia's interest to try to widen the war further. And we also have enough uh, evidence that Ukraine has done a very good job of keeping track of the weapons that it has been uh, getting from the United States and from other Western allies. There had been concerns about leakage of weapons, about corruption um, that I think have been gradually overcome with time as, as Ukraine has proven itself to be um, uh, good at monitoring those weapons and at allowing uh, US monitors to come in. Um, and the problem is, as, as you've stated, it is, uh, it is a little bit too late um, to have the ideal outcome. But on the other hand, I can understand uh, what the slowness was about. And, you know, I think if the Biden administration had moved too quickly, uh, then it would have faced uh, criticism from the other side, saying that it was being overly provocative towards Russia, uh, which, of course, it is already facing from uh, many elements uh, in the United States uh, and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, and so I think, again, it's a, it's a very difficult situation, and perhaps it could have moved uh, more quickly. Um, but I think we can also understand why it was more hesitant uh, to do too much too quickly. That might have been uh, something that uh, led uh, the situation off the rails before it became clear where things were going. Mm, and I'll remind our viewers that 2021 20, months ago, uh, we were all also worried about whether Russia would use nuclear weapons at any point in time. Those fears weren't realized, but they were a factor in some of the, the thinking and decision making on the part of Western policymakers. Artur, I want to bring you back in to sort of reflect on one thing that Kim said, which was that it's been a bit of a surprise to see um, how Republicans have you know, in a sense, uh, retrenched a bit um, from the rest of the world. And there's, you know, you can sort of draw a line um, all the way back to the founding fathers of, you know, a, a sentiment of American isolationism. But in recent years, um, and perhaps this comes from uh, reactions to how the war on terror pr played out and how the war in Iraq played out, um, that it seems like America's appetite for being engaged in entanglements abroad has drastically reduced over the last few years. How do you see that as a diplomat who's you know spent so much time in DC over the last uh, couple of decades? Yeah, no, this this certainly has been a cyclical um, process in American history. Um, we've we've seen moments of increased isolationism uh, and. Uh, 
decreased appetite for U.S. engagement. But I, I think that what we're seeing in the Republican Party um, is is troubling because uh, I think there is a there is a, an important retrenchment from um, understanding how the U.S. A needs to play a leadership role on a number of global issues where the U.S. can uh, uh, make the difference, and B uh, of understanding how the how the rest of the world impacts. Um, U.S. domestic policy. Um, but at the same time, uh, yes, they're, 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 you know this whole debate over whether we, the U.S. should be supporting Ukraine or not, the fact that um, a Republican bill is uh, separating financial support for Ukraine, decoupling financial support for Ukraine from financial support uh, for Israel, despite President Biden's entreaties that both of these issues be linked together, um, but at the same time, you've got a you've got a wing uh, on the extreme right of the Republican Party who um, is suggesting that one of the top foreign policy priorities of the United States is to bomb Mexico uh, to prevent the flow of fentanyl coming in uh, into the United States and feeding this uh, tremendous, dreadful. Uh, epidemic of opioid abuse in the U.S. And to a certain extent, it seems like um, all the roads for the Republican primary lead through the border to Mexico, through, lead, lead through the border with Mexico. And so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a schizophrenic approach because, yes, on the one hand, sort of the larger traditional um, uh, global and foreign policy issues that the Republican Party used to articulate have sort of fallen off the side. But at the same time, you see this sort of pimping uh, of uh, foreign policy issues like the relationship with Mexico, which started with Donald Trump in his 2016 campaign, remember? Uh, Mexican rapists and bad hombres and NAFTA is the worst treaty ever signed and, and negotiated by the United States. These, these, were, these were the um, the banners with which Trump in many ways campaigned in 2016 and they're being... Um, rebooted and and turbocharged by many of the current geopolitical contenders in the primary as a means of overtaking Trump by the right and uh, ensuring that they can sound as hardline as Trump or even more so in using certain foreign policy issues, migration, uh, the border with Mexico is the primary national security threat to the United States. And so there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a contradiction, um, even though I do understand that uh, uh, the the use of Mexico as a political electoral piñata um, is driven by domestic politics more than a particular foreign policy vision within the Republican Party. Mm. Fascinating. Um, I want to remind all of our viewers around the world to send in questions. I am seeing streams of questions come in, and I want to get to them, and we have a fair bit of time to take them in. But I want to bring in one final thing uh, before we move to some questions from you in the audience, and that is China. And Michael, I thought I'd begin with you here. You are um, the expert on China's economy. Uh, you've written several uh, terrific articles in my magazine, Foreign Policy, but also your book, Danger Zone, which I think is terrific. And I'm curious, with China's recent economic slowdown, um, which I should point out to our viewers, you've been predicting for quite a while, um, how does that slowdown impact the likelihood of, say, Beijing invading Taiwan, um, and therefore of the United States getting involved in yet another war? So I think uh, countries look to the future and leaders ask themselves, uh, is our situation going to be getting better or worse in the future? And if it's going to be getting worse, it doesn't necessarily mean that you immediately launch an invasion, but it certainly raises the risk just for the simple reason that you have this window of opportunity and you have to worry that if you don't use the money and muscle that you have now, that you might lose that opportunity going down the line. And so I think it's the combination of a slowing economy you see China increasingly strategically encircled all these anti-China alliances popping up, countries around them beefing up their militaries. Uh, 
you see the decline of, of peaceful options of accomplishing longstanding aims that Chinese leaders have always said, at some point, we're going to do this. And in particular, making China whole again, reabsorbing these lost territories that the CCP says were unjustifiably ripped away from China during the century of humiliation. Obviously, Taiwan, but big parts of the East and South China Seas, chunks of India, and in all of those cases, you know, with Taiwan, the Taiwanese view themselves as more Taiwanese, and that doesn't seem to be changing and just don't consider, you know, peaceful reunification. Uh, you know, the, inter the world court ruled that China's claims to the South China Sea are null and void. And so there really isn't using international law to lay claim to those territories. India is massing forces on its border near the disputed territories there. So it's the combination of a slowing economy and the fear that you're just not going to be able to amass wealth and power at the same rate that you were before, feeling like there are enemies swirling all of around you, and then seeing these territories that you've always said you're going to take back, and that Xi Jinping himself has staked his legitimacy on reclaiming. I mean, that is sort of the CCP's claim to fame is making China whole again and throwing off the century of humiliation. It doesn't mean a war is inevitable, but it just means that these warning signs, and this is well established in international relations theory that when issues become less divisible, war becomes more likely, especially over territory. When the balance of power, at the local balance of power becomes less clear, uh, war becomes more likely. When this rising power's expectations for the future start to turn negative and it becomes more of a peaking power, war becomes more likely. And personalist dictatorships are more than twice as likely to start stupid wars as any other regime for the obvious reasons that we've seen play out in Putin's case with the, you know, surrounded by sycophants, bad information, miscalculation, delusions of grandeur. And so it's, it's China's just giving off a lot of worrying signs. And so I don't think we can take for granted that China will just kind of sit out the, uh, the violent party that we're seeing emerge around the world right now. Mm. Kim, I know you focus a fair bit on the geopolitics of climate change and climate envoy John Kerry is meeting his Chinese counterpart, Xi Xinhua, this week. Do you think that China and the United States can compartmentalize climate change? And, you know, by this, I mean, you know, can they compete in some other areas, but then cooperate on decarbonization? Is that even possible? So I think when we're looking at the question of decarbonization, we have to recognize that both China and India uh, see coal development as something that is necessary for their own security purposes, at least at the moment, because it allows them to have uh, electricity production that is not uh, reliant on any other country. Um, and China has been very careful to diversify its energy supplies so that it does not have reliance on anyone. We've seen limits, for example, on how much China is uh, willing to import uh, Russian oil and natural gas uh, even though the amounts have increased a lot in the past year, taking advantage of Russia's situation with the lost markets uh, because of the uh, Ukraine invasion, there's still limits on how much China wants to cooperate with Russia on energy issues. But I think one bright spot in there is that China is really dominant in the solar energy market. And that has, of course, created competition and conflict with the United States because the United States is reluctant to become dependent on China for its solar uh, energy requirements. We've also seen India be very concerned about becoming too dependent on China for its solar energy requirements. And India is um, currently trying to jumpstart its own domestic solar industry. Um, but I think that one of the things we've seen the United States do in particular, um, in addition to trying to work with China as much as possible, is trying to reach um, bilateral and multilateral accords that don't necessarily require Chinese cooperation in order to move climate change uh, goals forward, while at the same time through things like the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, trying to jumpstart um, renewable energy production and uh, adoption and adaptation um, in the United States. Uh, given that there is this conflict ongoing with China over its solar energy. And of course, the one thing that is um, a, sort of a, a sticking point with uh, the Chinese solar energy production is that uh, much of the uh, solar material is produced in Xinjiang uh, using Uyghur uh, uh, forced labor, according to the United Nations, not according just to the United States. Um, and that is something that hits up against human rights concerns as well. 
But I guess, you know, my hope is not in having global accords on climate, but on having more bilateral and multilateral accords that move things forward. And I think we've seen a number of these with the United States spearheading efforts um, to encourage, for example, South Africa and Indonesia to move away from coal and now moving towards uh, India as being the next on that list. Um, and so even if there is um, an inability to have truly global accords with real agreement between the United States and China, I think it's possible to make progress in other ways um, and um, uh, to perhaps uh, keep the dialogue open, which is probably the most important thing. Mm. Staying with the U.S.-China relationship, uh, Arturo, when you look at the world's two largest economies locking horns in the way that they have been. I mean, tensions between the two have been rising for several years now. What is the mood like in a place like Mexico? I I imagine that most countries like Mexico, they want to get along with both sides, right? Well, I I think there's an inclination to not have to pick and choose um, to be able to cherry pick. Now, there's a big difference between Mexico and other, for example, uh, Latin American nations, which is that Mexico is not a commodities exporter. And therefore, um, the deep footprint that China developed over the last two decades, particularly with commodities exporting nations in South America, doesn't exist in Mexico. You're now seeing a a curious development because with the de-risking and potential, potential decoupling of trade and economic ties between China and the United States, you're seeing Chinese companies moving to the northern part of Mexico, A, to piggyback on USMCA, um, and to take advantage, you have the US Mexico uh, Canada Free Trade Agreement, the revamped NAFTA, um, uh, to piggyback on that to be able to uh, export to the United States, but also to take advantage of integrated supply chains in North America and um, the border infrastructure that exists between both countries. Um, having said that, I think that there's also a growing realization in Mexico that Mexico can be one of the most important beneficiaries of that recalibration of U.S. foreign policy towards China. It's the most, in my view, it's the most recalibration of U.S. foreign policy interests since the end of the Cold War and German reunification. Uh, This very, very few things elicit consensus, bipartisan consensus in Washington, D.C. these days. One of those is China, where both Democrats and Republicans alike are convinced that the status quo ante with China, whether it's on trade, economic relations, uh, or geopolitical and military issues, uh, is untenable. In that recalibration, Canada and Mexico play a very important and fundamental role uh, in the success of Washington's ability to mitigate to lower risk to um, uh, have to uh, have the ability to relocate uh, uh, essential sector production to the North American continent. Uh, that's why energy policy is such an important piece of whether North America can actually pull this together, because you you do need to develop a North American paradigm of uh, uh, resilient, independent, sustainable, secure energy for the for the region. Um, and so I, I think that that with the whole debate over New York, or allied shoring or French shoring, whatever you want to call this, uh, there's a growing sense that if if Mexico can get its act together, which so far it hasn't done, um, it could become one of the biggest beneficiaries of this relocation and investment to deepen those essential supply chains in North America, to create common domain awareness in North America, which basically means North American perimeter security understood at large it's not only who comes into the three north american continent uh, the three north american nations from abroad but it's being able to develop common cybersecurity protocols how do we protect and uh um prevent cyber attacks against critical infrastructure in the three north american countries where uh, electricity grids for example are increasingly interconnected with pipelines crisscrossing the three borders between the US and Canada and Canada and and Mexico. So I I think there's a, there's a bit more of a, of a, of a pragmatic approach in Mexico 
towards the relationship with China. Uh, China isn't our main trading partner by by far, uh, which you don't see in other countries in South America. You know, Chile, Argentina, uh, Brazil have China as their number one trading partner. It's not the case with Mexico. And so I think that gives Mexico a certain leeway that other countries, at least in the Americas, have when they consider their triangular relations between Washington, Beijing, and their respective capitals. Mm. Michael, uh, one of the things Arturo said, of course, is that you know in D.C., if if you if there's one issue that Democrats and Republicans agree on, then it is uh, about being tougher on China. But it seems to me that the United States and China have been talking to each other a bit more in recent weeks. And all of that leading up to um, Chinese President Xi Jinping coming uh, to APEC to meet President Biden uh, later this month. I think that's been about 10 days. Um, are you feeling more optimistic about the trajectory of US-China relations and diplomacy uh, on that front? Diplomacy is important, uh, should continue, but it's at the end of the day insufficient to lead to a real breakthrough. Um, and so talking is good, but what, what are the terms of the talks? I think we'll have to wait and see, but the only way you're going to get a breakthrough is if um, common interests emerge between the two countries or there is some kind of shift in the balance of power such that one of the two countries can impose its interests onto the other. And you know, I'm, the Chinese are always talking about win-win outcomes, but honestly, I, I don't see a lot of win-win in the core issues in the relationship. If you just look at something that, like Taiwan, which is about to have this very important election, you know, is it going to be ruled from Taipei or is Beijing going to step in? I'm sure the Americans would love to kick the can down the road on that indefinitely, but China has made very clear, no, we're not just going to settle for this de facto independent status quo. Uh, the South China Sea, you know, is that Chinese waters or international waters? Um, Russia, should that be propped up or should that be ground down with sanctions and arms transfers to Ukraine? Um, you know, the alliances that the United States has in East Asia for the United States, those are just a, a force for stability. But for China, it's hostile encirclement. And I think both the US and Chinese governments are fundamentally correct in their respective assessments of those. So I just, you know, talking is good. I think the door to diplomacy should always be kept open because that's the first step you're going to need for the breakthrough. But if you just look at the history of great power rivalries, these typically do not end with a bunch of happy talk and the two sides realizing, oh, it was just some big misunderstanding and uh, we actually want the same thing. It usually ends when one side loses the ability to compete. And so the best case scenario is a Cold War scenario where one side peacefully runs out of gas. Um, I'm sorry to say in the vast majority of cases, it ends in a catastrophic war. So hopefully these talks will just kind of help keep the lid on conflict, but I don't expect any kind of major breakthrough. And I distinctly remember all of the previous time, you know, I remember Xi Jinping coming to the, the United States and promising not to militarize the South China Sea and then doing just that, promising not to engage in cyber espionage and doing just that. I also remember the, the history of U.S.-China engagement and and Clinton, you know, paving China's path to the WTO and going to Beijing and uh, uh, articulating the three no's on Taiwan, you know, no independence, no uh, uh, membership in international organizations, no two Chinas. And then we now know from documents, internal documents from Chinese leaders that Jiang Zemin was immediately saying, you know, this can this engagement policy that the United States has, don't believe it. It's a containment policy. They're trying to bring us down. They're trying to westernize us, westernize us split us apart. And I think there's some truth in that. I mean, that what Americans view is just integrating China and turning it into a responsible stakeholder basically threatens the CCP's monopoly on power. They saw what happened when Gorbachev tried to integrate the Soviet Union into the Western system. The whole thing unraveled. So I think they're from their perspective, I can understand why they view overzealous engagement as a threat. And that's why I just think it's very unlikely. I just don't see Xi Jinping being softer on the United States than Jiang Zemin was. And even at the height of US-China engagement, you had tremendous strategic distrust bubbling under the surface. I'm gonna move on to other um, questions and questions from our audience in a minute. But Michael, I also just have to ask you about the Chinese economy. And there's been uh, in our circles, 
so much debate in recent months about whether China's economy has uh, what one economist calls economic long COVID, um, or whether the prognosis for its economy is a little bit better. Where do you come down on this debate? Where do you see China's uh, economy looking, you know, a year from now, two years from now? I, I just think all of the factors that enable China's rapid growth are now turning into severe liabilities. So longer term, you have the demographic collapse, but even in the short term, Beijing's policy seems to be to try to take investment that was going to the real estate sector and now pump it into the manufacturing industries, especially what Xi Jinping calls the real economy or the hard industries, you know, the heavy industries, the high tech, um, especially emerging technologies that may pump up the growth rate, you know, in manufacturing temporarily. But if I, I think it's going to be a similar problem, because if you look at manufacturing in China, there was already tremendous excess capacity, you know, a lot of wasted assets, a lot of factories that really aren't generating a whole lot of value. Um, it's just way an outsized share of China's GDP already. And so it's hard to see how just pumping in lots more easy money and just force feeding capital through the system is going to lead to a more efficient, positive growth model. The other factor, another reason China's economy is slowing is just the international pressure it's facing countries are just less and less willing to tolerate Chinese mercantilism. And so China faces thousands of new trade and investment barriers that are crimping its market and tech access. And this new strategy that's going to flood the market with a bunch of Chinese manufactured goods is just going to heighten those protectionist sentiments, um, especially in, in the West. And so it's just hard to see how that policy and you combine that with Xi Jinping just really reasserting the primacy of the Communist Party in every institution and really turning the screw on all of these previously somewhat at least private companies that now have to have political commissars on staff and having dictating you know outcomes as opposed to letting the market kind of guide them um, and then having foreign investment dry up it just seems like um, the combination of of state the reassertion of state control the uh, the international protectionism and then you look longer term you have the debt overhang and the demographic collapse it's really hard to see how China is going to be able to generate sustainable growth going forward. Mm. So um, I've been asking all the questions so far, but I think it's time now to take some questions that have been coming in from our viewers around the world. And Kim, I'm going to put the first one to you. And this one is about Ukraine and Gaza. And it's about what rebuilding might look like in a post-conflict scenario. And specifically here, what role the United States could or should be playing um, in such reconstruction? So that's a really good question. And I think we have to recognize that the two situations are very different from each other. So Ukraine has actually been rebuilding on the fly. Um, uh, when there have been um, horrific attacks against particular Ukrainian cities, and then those Ukrainian cities have either remained in uh, the control of Ukrainian ground forces or Ukraine has regained land that had originally been occupied by Russia, uh, we've seen uh, rebuilding happening um, as the war is uh, progressing. And so it's not a situation where we are going to face all of the rebuilding happening at the close of the war. Obviously, there's going to be an awful lot of rebuilding that has to be done. And one of the uh, uh, considerations is the extent to which the money that has been frozen uh, in uh, Russian asset accounts located abroad, uh, including the, the assets that are owned by Russian oligarchs who are close to Putin, uh, to what extent that should be put towards Ukrainian reconstruction. So that's really what the what the issues are there. Um, I think in in Gaza, I'm I'm certainly less of an interest, uh, less of an expert in the Middle East. Um, but I think that um, when we're looking at a situation where Israel's goal is to ensure that Hamas cannot rise again, I, I think rebuilding of Gaza is probably not going to look the way that Gaza looked in the past. I think you know we don't know what Israel's ultimate goals are. I, I'm not sure that Israel has even had the political bandwidth to think about what its ultimate goals are, but I would not predict that there is going to be the same sort of desire um, by Israel to rebuild Gaza to what it used to be in the sense that there is a desire by the Western community, and it's not just the United States, it's the European Union and the World Bank as well, um, to, to um, uh, try to come out of this with Ukraine being as uh, stable and uh, as, as developed as possible um, in, the, in the aftermath of the, of the Russian invasion. Mm. 
Let's take another um, question from one of our viewers and uh, Arturo, this one's coming to you. Um, the question goes, you, Arturo, are probably right about the global south. However, this is when you were saying that you, you don't buy it as a term. Um, however, the questioner goes on to say the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly votes on a ceasefire uh, in, in Gaza. That resolution seemed to line up pretty well around a West versus Global South narrative, wouldn't you say? Um, that's the question. Your thoughts? No, I, I, I absolutely think that um, on, on issues like this, there is a general alignment. You see it also when the UN General Assembly, for example, votes on whether the US should end the embargo against Cuba. There's that almost same alignment. It's basically just the US, Israel, and maybe a couple of other nations that vote uh, to abstain or against that resolution. So it's usually these types of resolutions that, that garner that type of realignment. But but I, I would stick to my guns by underscoring that uh, the, the differences between the big global South in terms of outlooks, appetites, bandwidths, political, geopolitical aspirations, very, very diverse. And again, let me go back to the BRICS example, because if you, if you, that's sort of a microcosmos of the global South. And even though um, you've got sort of the founding BRIC members, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, remember South Africa then was a later addition where it became BRICS um, before it was BRIC S apostrophe, apostrophe S. Um, the, the differences in geopolitical outlook between, uh, for example, uh, Russia, India, uh, and China are very different on a host of issues. Uh, reform of the Security Council, the uh, debate as to whether the permanent members of the Security Council should be augmented or not, which is a generally sort of reform of the Security Council is a generally popular topic in the global south. Um, despite the BRICS paying lip service to the reform of the Security Council, um, behind closed doors, the last thing Russia wants to do is to allow new permanent members in because what they don't want is a Germany in the UN Security Council. And China does not want India uh, in the Security Council. So um, once you scratch a bit underneath that sort of you know, these types of votes and these types of positions on issues like the reform of global governance and the UN Security Council, you start seeing the fractures and the tectonic gaps that exist between uh, the positions of a number of countries of the so-called global south. And I'll remind our viewers that the term BRICS was coined by uh, an analyst at Goldman Sachs. Um, so yeah, it's not chief, like... Chief economist at, Glo at Goldman Sachs. And it was it was to sell... It was to sell a fund. Right. Uh, it was an investment fund. And uh, these four nations thought that it was a good idea, even though the differences that exist in terms of, you know, some are democracies, some are certainly not democracies. Um, and now with this sort of BRICS plus where they're adding new countries, I think will further dilute the idea that this is sort of a core club with a number of core principles. Right, right. Um, Arturo, I want to stay with you for a minute and ask you a, a follow on question. And I'm trying to sort of take in a lot of uh, viewer questions all at once in, in this sort of big umbrella question I'm going to put to you. But the question goes like this. We've been talking about the BRICS. There are so many other kind of fractured, smaller block alliances. Um, there's the the Quad um, which is India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. There's something called I2U2, which is India, Israel, United States, UAE. Um, there's the G7, there's the G20, um, there's ASEAN. There are all of these different blocks and Australia, groups. UK, US. Uh, AUKUS, exactly. NATO, one could go on. Um, does this mean that we're entering this new fractured kind of era? And does it mean that multilateralism, the kinds of which we, you know, would see at the UN, does that mean that that is no longer as powerful a force? And, and if you're following me with all of this, does that mean that the United States has sort of failed to kind of be uh, 
a leader of the world um, or to use big multilateral institutions that it created, like the UN, to sort of use multilateralism as a force for good? This this is this is a a, a very important question because uh, first of all I think there is there is an important debate regarding the relevance of the UN both in terms of what happened in Eastern Europe and even more so now with what is happening in the Middle East as to the re- relevance of the UN you see that discussion when countries that are clear human rights violators get elected to the UN Human Rights Council and so I think there is a growing sense that the multilateral um, template that evolved after the Second World War that was then fine-tuned uh, a- after the end of the Cold War uh, is, is is if not in crises, at least needs to be revamped and rethought. And so I think what we're probably seeing is a move from broad-gauged multilateralism to regionalism, to much more a la carte, um, uh, topic-driven sub-regional groupings to address specific issues, challenges, and opportunities. You saw that in a way uh, with what last week in, in the UK at Bletchley Park with this first summit on artificial intelligence that brought 28 countries, very very disparate group of countries that came together in the UK last week under under the leadership of, of, uh, of the British government. Um, But you're starting to see, I think, a much more a la carte, um, case by case uh, building blocks of of collaboration. You even see it within regional things in in, in South America, for example, you're seeing um, uh, more focused organizations. You've got UNASUR, which groups the South American countries, but then you've got the Pacific Alliance, which groups the four countries in the Amer- the four countries in Latin America and the Caribbean that have a common view on uh, a rules-based international trading system, Mexico, Peru, Chile, and uh, Colombia. And so I, I think you're seeing a lot of a la carte approaches developing. Um, and to a certain extent, I think this overarching 65, uh, uh, 45,000 foot vision multilateralism that, that characterized the post-war and the post-Cold War um, may, 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 I wouldn't say maybe crumbling, but it, it's it's being certainly rethought and challenged by by some of these more ad hoc alliances and groupings that we're starting to see that can be more nimble, can be more effective in attaining very specific Mm. Kim, I saw you nodding quite vigorously there, so I'm going to bring you in. And, you know, one critique of what um, Arturo um, was just saying is that, you know, when you have a huge, big global problem like a pandemic or if a giant asteroid is coming to hit planet Earth, that's when you need global cooperation and your AUKUS and NATO and I2U2 and Quad is going to be uh, no good. Uh, Bletchley Park won't work. Um, So, for those big moments, um, and climate change is one of them as well, where you truly need global cooperation, and you you do need uh, an institution like the United Nations, um, which if it didn't exist, we would try to create it all over again. Um, how do you see that? I don't think you need a United Nations to solve uh, the climate crisis. I think that that is a an attempt that was tried repeatedly. And I think we've seen through the COP process that there are real limits to how far it can go, um, in part because there is just no way to monitor and enforce agreements. Uh, and there are very strong incentives by individual powerful countries who are by far not all Western countries. I think China and India are the, the prominent ones. Also, Indonesia has a very growing economy and is using more and more fossil fuels um, not to be limited um, by global uh, arrangements. But I think that that does not mean that we give up on dealing with climate change because we can do it in ways that are, uh, in fact, um, more a la carte, as Arturo said, which I think I, I really like that wording. I hadn't heard it before. Um, exactly. And there's another phrase we often use, and that's minilaterals instead of multilaterals. Minilaterals. Okay, but I mean, many of, these, many of the climate things that are happening are multilateral. They're just not global. So, for example, this new arrangement that's going to go forward to provide loss and damage uh, funding for 
Um, if we don't call it the global south, I'm not sure what else to call it. We can go back to calling it developing countries again. Um, but the loss and damage fund that looks like it is moving forward, it's going to be done under the aegis of the World Bank, uh, assuming that it gets uh, approved at the, um, the upcoming uh, climate conference that happens in Dubai uh, in November and December. And it looks like there's a lot of um, momentum behind it. Um, it doesn't look like China's going to be included in that, and that's okay. And yet it is not really a small, it's not a mini group, it's a very large group that are coming together um, with the recognition that this is the right thing to do. And the United States didn't get everything it wanted by a long shot, um, but it did manage to get the World Bank as being the, the place at which the funding is going to go out of, where the U.S. has a dominant voice, um, and where there is a history of um, uh, and, and a lot of pressure to do more monitoring um, to see that the funds are actually going to what they're expected to be going to. So I wouldn't call that mini, but I would call it multilateral rather than global. And if China chooses to stay off on one side, China is still doing other things that are contributing to making climate change better, like everything that it's doing with solar uh, energy. And I, I think what we saw with the pandemic response is that it was very much in, in many ways a failure. It came too slowly. Um, it was something that really emphasized the global inequalities between states. Um, even when the, the very high quality vaccines were made available, um, uh, they were not something that was appropriate um, to many countries that are uh, located near the equator and that don't have uh, good uh, electrical uh, cooling systems because there was no way to get them to outlying areas. Um, and that maybe one of the reasons that uh, the crisis wasn't worse than it otherwise might have been was, in fact, the slowdown in globalization that happened um, that allowed things to sort of uh, peter out uh, at some of uh, the corners of the world that were not so um, intensely globalized. But I think we're learning from the, the what happened in the pandemic that we probably don't want to try exactly the same things again if a similar situation uh, arises. And I think also the U.S. came to recognize how much harm it actually did its Itself by not being more generous with its vaccine support, um, because the slowdown in the global economy um, that was in many ways caused by COVID, the disruption in the supply chains that were caused by COVID came back and hurt the U.S. economy. Um, and so I think that did make us realize how interdependent we are, but I'm still not convinced that any solution necessarily has to be global, has to be done at the universal UN level, as opposed to being widely multi multilateral. Mm. Michael, let me put another viewer question to you. And this one goes like so. Is force the path in dealing with Russia and Iran and diplomacy in dealing with China? I actually think you need a combination of strength and diplomacy with all three of those countries. I mean, in some ways, it's the the old uh, Reagan or George Schultz playbook. You need the diplomacy in order to have the talks, but it has to be backed up with strength. Otherwise, there's no incentive for the other side to make any kind of concessions. And it just seems like that has to be the case with all three. I mean, is, is Xi Jinping going to lay off Taiwan if you don't have adequate force to compel <laughs> that laying off? Is he going to demilitarize the South China Sea without that? So I, I, I think, you know, just because there's a hot war in Europe, uh, and not yet a hot war going on in Asia does not mean that force does not come into play. You know, most of military uh, influence in the world takes place before a shot is even fired. It's present in the back of policymakers' minds, the military balance and what the likely outcome of a war would be. And right now, I worry that um, in the same way that deterrence failed in Europe, that arguably deterrence failed in the Middle East, that we could be setting ourselves up for a deterrence failure in East Asia, just given that China is coming off of 10 years of churning out military hardware of all kinds, warships, all kinds of missiles, that, and the United States and, and Taiwan have been extremely slow to, um, to, to diversify their base structure, uh, to harden their bases, and so they are like sitting ducks right now. Um, that, that is just leading up to a potential deterrence failure. And if you don't have that, then all these negotiations that we're seeing, if you're China, why would you give in? if you think that military force or the coercion that comes from that is potentially a viable option. So I, I see these all as part and parcel of just a basic fundamental of statecraft, like statecraft 101, you need the diplomacy, but you also have the strength to back it up. Mm. Kim, I saw you raise your hand, jump in. Yeah, I'm not sure that deterrence failed in Europe, because I don't think deterrence was tried in the case of Ukraine, except sort of the vague threats of sanctions. 
Um, uh, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Uh, NATO deterrence has succeeded very, very strongly. And now with Finland joining NATO and Sweden uh, about to join NATO as soon as Turkey and Hungary let it in, um, I think deterrence in Europe has actually succeeded quite strongly in keeping Russia out of uh, the, the NATO alliance. And, and I guess I would disagree a little bit with Michael. I know that he's the China expert, so I, I hesitate to take him on on this. Um, but I think it's actually been uh, maybe wise for Biden to say four different times uh, that, of course, the United States would come to Taiwan's defense, which, of course, goes against stated U.S. policy and at this point can no longer be considered an accident. That must be intentional on Biden's part. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I think there's a difference between China building up in the South China Sea and, and China doing something that would involve invading Taiwan or um, putting a um, some kind of a, a, you know, a quarantine of some kind against Taiwan to prevent it from trading in the international system. I mean, we know that Taiwan is the largest uh, international source of semiconductors. And, and that means that the, the West is not going to stand back and uh, allow nothing to happen if China decides to take that over. And one factor that that Michael has not mentioned is that amongst all this, uh, you know, so-called decoupling that we've seen between China and the West, um, the U.S. and Europe together remain overwhelmingly huge trading and investment partners for China. And China's economy would be harmed very badly if it chose to cut off those relationships. Um, uh, China is not seeing Russia as a viable alternative to its uh, economic relationships with Europe and the United States. So I agree with Michael that uh, deterrence and that uh, building up military power in the hopes that you never have to use it is something that makes a great deal of sense. But I am, again, just as I was more optimistic on Iran than Michael is, I think I'm more optimistic on China than Michael is in the sense that I don't think a, a war is in China's national interest. Michael, would you like to respond or I'm happy to move oh, on to another? Yeah, go for um, it. I mean, if, if Xi Jinping were a hedge fund mogul, then I would agree with Kimberly. If he if if his main concern was China's GDP uh, and maximizing every last ounce of efficiency in the Chinese economy, then I might agree with Kimberly. But he, the problem is Xi Jinping is not a hedge fund mogul and he also doesn't think like um you know, like professors like like we do that say, well, what's best for the Chinese people? He's an ardent uh, nationalist and a dictator who has revanchist claims on territory that he feels was unjustifiably ripped away from China. Um, and so I think his calculation and where Taiwan fits in, and frankly, for parts of the Chinese people too, I mean, I think we underestimate how emotional this issue is. And so it doesn't come down to simple cost benefit calculations. I think Xi Jinping if, if you were to tell him uh, you're going to grow at 0% for the next five years, but you're going to be the one that takes back Taiwan and fundamentally ends the Chinese civil war once and for all and smashes the U.S. alliance commitments in East Asia and reestablishes China as a great power, I think he would take that in a second. I mean, I think a lot of the things that Kimberly is saying were true of Vladimir Putin. Does it make economic sense no. to invade Ukraine? No. no, it's not. But, you know, these these guys have different decision calculuses than I think she we She is not Putin. She does not face Putin's structure. Putin is a personalistic dictator. Full stop. With nothing he is to not a personalistic against. who who is restraining she? She does have to get support the from the Communist that Party just, bureaucracy in a way that's disappeared in the last not. month alone. <laughs> I think that there's a difference between being aggressive and militaristic and invading Taiwan. And I think that we need to keep those two things separate. Mm. Well, um, I'm going to move on to one more topic um, before we close, and that is taking a little bit of a step back. And that is a question from a viewer who asks, um, how do you think JFK would react to a post-Cold War situation um, such as what we're facing in the Middle East and Ukraine, as well as the risk to Taiwan, basically all of the things that we've been discussing. Um, Arturo, would you like to take that one on? You're on mute again. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It takes me a few seconds to move my finger. And, and <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I certainly think that uh, the concept, the idea of peace through strength would would be a, a central component of Kennedy's approach to to these issues, uh, particularly as to how you prevent a repeat of what has happened in Eastern Europe occurring in the South China Seas and, and across the Taiwan Straits. Um, I think it also would be characterized, um, which maybe runs counter to what we're discussing, we were discussing a few minutes ago, I think it would be 
Um, there would be a lot of grand coalition building, maybe again these larger constructs of multilateral uh, of multilateralism and regional blocks. Uh, whereas again, I think that given the fluidity of the international system, the fact that I think that the if you look at geopolitical megatrends, they're heading. You know, one can try and be optimistic, but um, not Panglossian. And I think that most megatrends are going in the wrong direction in terms of volatility and fluidity, geopolitical fluidity. Um, so I think that smaller constructs, more nimble constructs were, would probably be a better way. But my sense would be that Kennedy, um, if he were operating in today's environment, would probably be trying to uh, would be trying to build these big, large coalitions um, to whether it's deter potential Chinese aggression or to contain uh, uh, Russian uh, 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 Russian ad f ru further Russian advances, particularly as Russia puts all of its cards into war of attrition with Ukraine and grinding this out and, and being able to launch a new offensive uh, in the winter. Uh, I, th I think that's where uh, Kennedy would probably be coming at this. Mm. And with that historical insight, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, it's fitting that we ended with JFK, given that the Kennedy Library, uh, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Museum has brought us here today. So I thank uh, the library for organizing this. Arturo Sarukan, you are the former Mexican ambassador to the United States. Kimberly Martin, you're a professor at Barnard College at Columbia University, and Michael Beckley, you teach at Tufts University. You're the author of Danger Zone, among many other excellent books. I thank you all for joining us from around the world. I'm told that these events often bring people from six continents together, maybe a seventh one day. I'm Ravi Agrawal. I'm the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine and the host of FP Live, where we also often host discussions just like this. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, Ravi.